Welcome to 360 Money Matters, where financial planners Billy and Andrew talk all things financial planning. This podcast aims to increase your knowledge and confidence with all things money. Each week, they will cover topics like wealth creation strategies, investment principles, creating passive income, paying off your debt faster, and much, much more, so you can live a life on your terms without limits. Andrew, we're back. Podcast series, episode number two, which we're talking about. We are talking today in our second part of our, well, it's it's six steps, but seven podcasts. The first one was a bit of an introduction, and today is all about step one in your financial plan, and that is understanding your current position and developing your financial goals. Exciting, exciting. So, First part with understanding your current position. It sounds pretty straightforward. We talk about identifying and understanding where you're at from an income perspective, an expenses point of view, what your assets are and what your liabilities are. And although that sounds quite simple and with a little bit of help, it can be simple, but really something that you we need to nail in order to get a great understanding of the position that we've got before we can move forward in developing any financial strategy. So uh, I guess the first thing, it sounds pretty straightforward, Andrew, your income, identifying what that looks like and understanding that. What does that look like? Yeah. I mean, look, it's straightforward when you consider what the majority of people are, and that's employees, you earn a salary, you earn a wage, you have an income that's you know consistently coming in. However, for some, it's not as straightforward. So if you're earning you know, commissions, if you're self-employed and your income is a little bit more sporadic, it's really about getting a good understanding of exactly what that income is. So if you're getting rental income from an investment property, it's not all of the rental income from that investment property. If you're getting income from the wage that you're earning, it's not all of the income from the wage. It's really stripping out your expenses, stripping out your debt, more sorry, stripping out your tax liability above and beyond that and getting a realistic expectation of what it is. So it's not about your income on the best month when you've earned a whole heap of commissions. It's about you know what your actual income has been and what's expected to happen sort of moving forward as well. Yeah, it gets a little bit trickier when you've got income that fluctuates, side hustles, changes with income based on performance like commissions and bits and pieces like that. But it really is just a matter of capturing all of that to get an understanding of what your, I guess, from a monthly basis, what your income is on a monthly basis. And then, you know, depending on how you run your household budget, maybe you strip that back to weekly or fortnightly. But it's really getting an understanding of everything that's coming into the household from all the different sources to try and identify exactly what that is. With most people, depending on what role you're in with work and where your money is being generated from, you may have some influence over that. If you're in a position where you can either do more hours, you've got a side hustle, if you're commission-based role and it's based on performance, you get bonuses and things like that. For other people, it may just be the same amount of money coming in week in, week out or month in, month out. Whatever that is, it's is, you're going to have to take either what it is If it's consistent or if it fluctuates because of performance or hours or what have you, it's really looking at an average to try and come up with that number that's going to be consistent in the plan that you put together and really work off that. And if you manage to have a month that's higher than your average, then I guess that's just an additional leap. Just a bit of a bonus. That's it. Exactly right. And these side hustles, they're just a common theme these days. It's almost like everyone's earning a normal income and a normal wage and doing something else on the side, which is one of the beauties of technology in the current world that we're living in. You've got uh, so much more of an opportunity to do that these days. So, I mean, and that'll come more in probably step number two that maximizing your income is a massive part of it as well and making sure that you're really driving that as much as possible. Yeah, well said, well said. The next part of that is obviously your expenses. This is always a the one least of, fun part. <laughs> one, one, one that varies a fair bit based on different households and different tastes and different people. And there's a bit of difference in what we see between expectation and reality. <laughs> so what actually looks good on paper and what it should be versus what actually happens. And let's be honest, it's pretty easy to spend money online these days, especially when you're at home in front of the computer and you can't go anywhere. And we're finding that what should be happening versus what happens in reality are two different things. So getting an understanding of your expenses, where your money's going, and trying to really be realistic when you're putting that down and recording that because we don't want to capture something that's not happening. We need to be realistic, warts and all, I guess, to be able to capture what that is. Yeah. And look... You don't or you can't solve a problem unless you recognize that there is an issue, not that there's you know a problem or anything like that. But if you're really trying to drive your expenses down, you've got to be realistic about how much they actually are rather than sort of understating what those expenses are. So 
really important to get a good grasp and understanding of what your expenses are, how many of those or what expenses are variable, so how much you can actually change. And again, probably jumping a little bit forward in relation to, you know, step number two, but, you know, identifying where your expenses are, how many of those expenses are variable, how many of those expenses are fixed um, is a really important step in really understanding your, your current financial position. Yeah, we'll do a deeper dive on that in step number two and trying to get to a position where your expenses are more variable and fixed tends to be the yeah. way to go. And we'll do a deeper dive on that in the next podcast that we're doing when we talk about one. maximizing surplus. <laughs> Yeah, the fun one after that is really, what are your assets? That's always a bit exciting. That's always what people are pretty interested to share because you're proud and should be proud of you know the assets that you have and what you've managed to accumulate. So the next thing in really understanding is where are your assets? Where are they sitting? I think this is the easiest one because I don't know about you, Andrew, but most of the financial circumstances that I'm aware of, probably the assets I could reel off yeah. with a higher degree of accuracy more than the other ones. The other ones need a bit more, you know, a bit more looking at and a bit more of a deeper dive. But from an assets perspective, identifying what they are, most people we're finding that most people have that number or those an idea of where their assets are sitting. Except just off the top thing. of just off the top <laughs> of the head. So except for maybe one thing, I tend to find that I don't know about you, but everyone forgets about super. It's one of those things yeah. that's there. It's an asset, but no one really includes it as an asset and tends to be a forgotten child. Maybe the middle child. You're right, but ten percent of your income's nothing to sneeze at, right? So absolutely. Forced savings, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Super tends to be the one that we forget about the most or pay the least attention to. But I Identifying your assets is always imperative in understanding your current position. And really, that's about figuring out where you are and seeing if those assets deriving any income, are they performing? Can we borrow against them if we're leveraging when we talk about our strategies further down the track? But getting a really clear understanding of your assets is imperative as part of this process. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe even to a larger degree, getting an understanding of your liabilities is perhaps even more more important in all of this, especially once you start talking about debt minimization and debt strategies. The next part is understanding what are your liabilities, what are your loans, your personal loans, your expenses, and not even, I mean, it's, it's probably more of an expense than anything, but another liability is not just the expenses and the debts that you have, but also are you making child support payments? That's another liability that's really important to get a grasp on and understanding of. Yeah, spot on. And we find that if you do have liabilities, depending on what they are, if they're significant or if they're non-competitive, from a cash flow perspective, it can really have a significant difference on your financial future and making sure that understanding where they are firstly, and then part of any good strategy development, making sure that you are getting a good deal, you are on a competitive interest rate, you are paying attention to knocking down or focusing on driving down debt of particular liabilities first. And there's a hierarchy and there's a sequence that you can concentrate on. And we'll talk more about that in step three when we get to that in the podcast series. But liability is the crucial one. And if that's not identified or managed properly, then that's something that easily derails any solid financial plan. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You put all of that together. And what's a really important step in understanding a current position is the dreaded word, the thing that (laughs) I was waiting (laughs) that we all hate. (laughs) What is it, Billy? Tell us. It's putting a budget together. (laughs) Not everybody's favorite topic. And I can hear the eyes rolling in the back of everybody's head. It doesn't need to be war and peace. You know, there's different things that you can use to put a, a budget together, whether it's pen and paper, whether it's a spreadsheet, whether it's some sort of online tool. You need to do that, at least in the first instance, to get an understanding of how everything's flowing. We'll introduce our money management system in step two, which makes managing your budget a hell of a lot easier. But at least in the first step and the first instance, you need to put it together using a budget tool. And one of the most important things that we're finding, Andrew, if you want to talk to everybody about what this is, because this seems to be the thing that that varies the most when we're talking about a budget. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times I've sat in front of a client, you go through a budget, it's everyone's really excited. There's a surplus income of 30 grand a year. You're all really happy. There's so much money to invest. And yet there hasn't been any changes to income and expenses. And yet you've only got 10 grand in savings. Doesn't make sense if your budget's showing an expectation of 30 grand surplus income and you've only got a very small amount of savings, then there's a difference between expectation and reality. And that's what it is. Develop your budget, do it as accurately as you possibly can, and then sort of take a bit of a step back and have a look at, (laughs) hey, if my budget's showing that I should be saving this amount, but I'm actually not. 
then what's going on and what's happening with it? Have I understated some of the expenses? Have I overstated the income? What's going on and why is this all out of whack and why is the expectation not matching the reality? The other thing too, which we're finding time and time again, is if you don't have a good money management system, it's really easy to have leakage. Yeah. And that's the thing that expectation versus reality is one thing. You really need to hold the mirror up and be honest in this step and as part of this process. But one of the other things is having a decent system in place to ensure that if you got you know, your money coming in, making sure that there's no leakage and you're sticking to whatever budget that you've set for yourself because you don't want to blow it out because it's too easy to spend money. And let's face it, it's really easy to spend money these days <laughs> with all of the online shopping that's available to us, but also with all of the other consumer debt products like the afterpays of the world and bits and pieces like that. Really easy to whip up and $100 here, $200 there may not sound like a lot and it may not be enough to derail you know, a financial plan. But you do that consistently enough and all of a sudden you've gone and eliminated, not only eliminated all of your surplus that you've got, but you've actually gone backwards as well and you've taken on debt. So you've spent more than you've earned. Yeah. And I think one of the most important things now, however you're doing your budget, I mean, it probably makes sense and it's a little bit easier to do it on a system that you can update. So whether it's an Excel spreadsheet, whether you use the Money Smart tools online, whatever it is to develop that budget. It makes sense to, I mean, if it's on pen and paper, it probably is going to get a little bit messy to scribble in and out, especially with your handwriting, Billy. (laughs) But it's important to really look at not what you expect or not what you hope your budget can be, but what it actually is. I mean, the first part in this is really understanding your current position. And that's the most important thing. It's not, I'm spending... $500 $500 on Uber Eats every week, but I actually need to reduce that. And so you put in your budget $100 a week. It's about understanding where is it at now. So the next step is about ma- step number two is really about maximizing your surplus. That's when that comes into it, not in this step here. Sort of overarching thing that I want to put on this is put a, a realistic budget together that encapsulates your current position, not where you want your position to be, which is, I think, mentally a bit of a hard thing to do because everyone wants to, I mean, I know when I'm uh, putting a budget together, you want it to look good and you want a green number at the end of it rather than a red. Comes back to that expectation versus reality as well too. And you really need to be honest with yourself in that step because that will set the foundation up for step number two, where we can really maximize your surplus and your cash flow. But if we don't have the right information when we're putting this step together, it becomes really difficult to do that. That then takes us on to the second part of this, which is developing goals. So Andrew, you want to talk us through what that looks like? Yeah, I mean, look, goals, what we're talking about is financial goals. Fortunately, we can't help you out with anything other than finances. We're pretty niche in what we're doing, but getting a good understanding of what it actually is that you want to achieve with your money. Now, the first thing that comes to most people's mind is retirement. That's really the key goal for most people and sort of most people when you're developing a plan is, you know, how do I retire and how do I make that, you know, happen quicker? Retirement is different for every single person, you know, and the second step is a massive part of of what helps you reach retirement and that's, you know, maximizing your surplus because that's all about reducing your expenses. So if your expenses are really high, then you're going to need more assets and more passive income coming in in order to you know, reach your retirement and passive income goals. Whereas if your expenses are low, it makes and sets that bar a little bit lower and much easier to achieve. There's no right or wrong way about it. I mean, some people want to spend a lot of money on the lavish things in life and that's perfectly fine. But as long as you're putting together a realistic goal that, hey, this is what I actually want from a retirement perspective, and this is the time frame that I want it. That's the other key. I mean, do you want it to happen in five years' time, 10 years' time, or 50 years' time? It's, I mean, hopefully it's not 50. That will be working for a very long time <laughs> if that's the case. And I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Like, it's different for everyone. And yeah. going through this process is completely individualized. Even the word retirement as such, you're talking about a long-term goal And the word retirement, retirement means different things to different people. Absolutely. It it could be in the traditional sense, you work until you're 65 and all of a sudden you've got this big pool of money, you never go back to work again and you sail off into the sunset. That could be one view of retirement. Somebody could retire and and their own definition could be moving from full-time work to part-time work and they could do that at age 60 or age 55. It really is different for everybody or it could be that, hey, the word retirement doesn't enter somebody's vocabulary. They just want to be in a position where they can pick and choose when they work. And the overarching theme and the overarching principle is that they've got enough money to support themselves so they never have to work again 
if they don't choose to. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it changes. So your goals and ambitions today are going to be different tomorrow. What you want to achieve today is going to be different to what you're going to want to achieve in five years' time. So all of this stuff really needs regular review. You need to ascertain that, hey, is what I'm striving towards still what I want? That's a really important step in all of this. And I think the thing that people struggle with very often is how much income do I actually need in retirement, Billy? You know, how do you determine that? It's different for everybody. And in the industry, you use a general rule of thumb. You know, you use a percentage of your uh, pre-retirement income. But once again, it really depends on everybody's circumstances and what type of lifestyle that they want. Like we said, retirement's one. But if you look at, I guess, different goals as well, too, because it's not just all about retirement. It could be a shorter or a medium term goal. Yeah. One of the things that we come across fairly often is looking at or talking to parents with young children that want to be in a position to fund, say, their children's education. That's something that's in the medium term. What amount of money do we need in order to send our kids to a particular school that we want? Or how do we get in a position where if they do go to university, we want to make sure that they're not relying on the HEC system so they start working. When they start their working career, they've got debt. We want to give them the opportunity to be able to start fresh. So we want to get to a position where we can pay for their university education. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a massive thing and sort of goes into you know the estate planning piece and all of that as well. Most people aren't just building wealth for themselves. You're building wealth for the people that you care about and the people around you. So it's education's one massive thing. I think even more broadly speaking, you just talk about, you know, funding expenses for kids because it's pretty scary to think. And I know, Billy, you know, you've got a couple of young kids married. So if I listen to my Greek parents, I'll have kids very soon as well. <laughs> but Thanks, another, mom and dad. <laughs> but another thing that it's education costs and making sure that you've got funding for that. But a lot of parents also want to give their kids an opportunity for starting their wealth creation early as well. When you consider what housing prices were 20 years ago versus what housing prices are now and what they're going to be in 20 years time, it's a pretty daunting and scary thing to think about how much, you know, our kids are going to be paying for a property and how much money they're going to need from a deposit perspective just to get into the market. So identifying or setting an amount of money aside or a lump sum that you want to give at a future point in time or an income stream that you want to give at a future point in time as a financial goal is a really massive thing and a really massive step to make sure that you're enriching not only your own life with your finances, but, you know, you're enriching the life of those around you as well. The key message there is it doesn't necessarily need to be something lavish. It could be as simple yeah. as, you know, talking about children and things. It could be, hey, when they turn 18, I want to be in a position where I can buy them a decent car so they can get around and get to their job or get to university or whatever it may be. So it doesn't necessarily need to be these huge, massive goals that are requiring massive amounts of money, massive amounts of planning in order to do it. It's different for everybody depending on their circumstances and what it is that they want to achieve. And as part of that process, we help identify that and flush that out. And I think the common thing with all of these once we have an understanding of what the goal is that we're aiming for and we understand the time frame, we understand the parameters that we're working within in relation to someone's income, someone's expenses, someone's assets and someone's liabilities, we can then really get into a position where we reverse engineer what it is that we're aiming for and start to work backwards in terms of what we need to do in order to achieve that. Yeah, absolutely. And this all comes down to really just not being on that constant wheel of just acquiring assets and acquiring assets and not really knowing what we're doing it for. It's a lot more meaningful and it sort of means a lot more when you're taking the steps to achieve what your goals are rather than just constantly buying assets and constantly doing different things with relation to your finances. Now, I'm obviously not going to be as an advisor, I'm not adverse to you know clients acquiring assets and that's what this is all about. But once you've got a goal that you're aiming towards, you're also acquiring the right type of assets. If your goal is to leave someone with a certain amount of money in a certain amount of time and you still want to maintain that asset, is purchasing property the right asset if you can't sell half of that property and you've got to liquidate the entire asset in order to gift a portion between two kids? Or it's making sure that the things that you're doing and the steps that you're taking are all going towards what you're trying to achieve out of it is really the important thing. And once that end goal is there and once you've got an end strategy, it becomes far simpler to reverse engineer what it is that we need to do in order to achieve those goals. And it also becomes a lot easier to monitor what happens if things don't go to plan, if the market doesn't perform, if 
you have a period of time where your income goes down, having a strategy on what we're doing to get to where we need to get to, any changes towards that strategy can be clearly mapped out as to are we still going to achieve that goal and are we not going to achieve that goal? Yeah, and the important thing with all of this is is having enough flexibility within whatever system is designed. We'll cover that in a little bit more detail in step four when we do develop an investment strategy, but you need to make sure that you do have enough flexibility for a couple of reasons, and I think you hit the nail on the head. The first reason is in case you change your mind or your time frame changes or your amount changes, you don't want to back yourself into a corner in terms of the strategy that you've got. And the second thing is, well, just because you've got that goal now, who knows if that goal is going to be around in the future as well, because let's face it, the only constant thing in life is change. So you want to make sure that you've got enough flexibility right across the board. But ultimately, identifying the goal, reverse engineering it, working within the confines of your assets, your expenses, your incomes and your liability, and being able to reverse engineer for that time frame that you've got for your goal is definitely a step in the right direction to achieving what it is that you're actually after. And that's really as simple as how we do it. Yeah, absolutely. And the more that you can build into it, the better it is. I mean, if you can build into all of this that, hey, I want to have an annual holiday and I want to either take myself and my partner or my family or everything on a holiday and pay for that through my investments rather than just my cash flow, there's a million different things and a million different goals that you can have at the end of this. And it doesn't need to just stop there. I mean, again, you talk about it more once we get to the last steps of jumping a bit ahead, but the estate planning piece, if your goal is to leave a certain amount of money for those around you, what are the steps that you need to take now in order to make sure that that can happen and that you can achieve exactly what it is that you want to achieve? I'm loving that goal, Andrew, talking about holidays, being stuck in lockdown for uh, and going up and down like a yo-yo. I think we're all fantasizing about being able to travel and go on those holidays unimpeded like we have in the past. So we're looking forward to those days and can't actually wait till that happens again. Yeah, and that Melbourne weather is definitely not helping us, especially when you've got those one degree mornings. <laughs> so guys, that's about it for our episode, introducing the topic of understanding your current position and developing your goals. I hope you got a fair bit out of it and you're starting to get an idea of the direction that we're going in and that's pretty much it yeah thanks very much for listening again guys and i'm looking forward to sharing the next step in our second part of the podcast series and that's really identifying managing your surplus and cash flow thank you guys see you next time thanks for listening today if you have any questions on what we talked about or would like to have a chat about your money journey visit us at 360fs.com.au Just a reminder to our listeners that the information contained in this podcast is general in nature and it is not intended as personal recommendations for the audience. Please consider whether the information suits your circumstances before acting on it. This information is provided by Billy Amaritas and Andrew Nicolaou of 360 Financial Strategists Proprietary Limited, authorised representatives and credit representatives of AMP Financial Planning.